Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the latest installment of the monthly Dataversity webinar series, Advanced Analytics with William McKnight. Today, William will be discussing the impact of machine learning on the enterprise today. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag ADV Analytics. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the bottom middle of your screen for that feature. And if you'd like to continue the conversation after the webinar, you can follow William and each other at community.dataversity.net. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for the series, William McKnight. William is the president of McKnight Consulting Group. He takes corporate information and turns it into a bottom line producing asset. He's worked with major companies worldwide, 15 of the Global 2000, and many others. McKnight Consulting Group focuses on delivering business value and solving business problems, utilizing proven, streamlined approaches in information management. His teams have won several best practice competitions for their implementations. He has been helping companies adopt big data solutions. And with that, I will give the floor to William to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Hello. Hello, Shannon. Hello, everyone. And welcome. And welcome back. Many of you, I, I, see, the, I see that you've come back for each and every one of these in the series, and I do appreciate that. Um, the topic today is kind of a pickup on last month's topic. Last month, I talked about artificial intelligence and getting data ready for artificial intelligence. That remains a very hot topic. Today, I'm going to be talking about the impact of machine learning on the enterprise today. Um, last time, we, when we got to the Q&A, surprisingly to me, we got a, I got a lot of questions about the impact of artificial intelligence on life in general. Uh, what's it going to mean to jobs? What's it going to mean to life and relationships? And what about bias in the, in the data and all this sort of thing? And are we headed to Big Brother and all this sort of thing? And uh, I was a little surprised, as I said, because I kind of gear these presentations towards practitioners. But you know what I learned? I learned is I learned that practitioners are people too. And so uh, I'm going to um, let my hair out a little bit uh, this time and maybe address some of that because there's a lot of carryover from artificial intelligence to machine learning, as we'll learn today. I also want to reiterate what Shannon said about come on on, coming on into the Dataversity forums and other places on dataversity.net and uh, catching up with uh, some of the things that are going on there. I'm going to jump in the forum later today and uh, answer some of your questions, uh, pick up on some of the conversations there, and contribute. And uh, I'd suggest that uh, you might want to as well, some good stuff going on in there. Um, now, I'm not an expert at the uh, at machine learning yet from an implementation perspective. I do understand the process pretty well by now. I do understand all the algorithms that are available, or at least the major ones. And I can size up a problem into machine learning or not uh, pretty quickly. As a matter of fact, as I take a look back at the enterprise challenges that I've been presented with over the past few months, I'll, let's say this year, uh, I can say that 50% of them or so could be solved with machine learning. And that's been my stance uh, around uh, uh, how these enterprise challenges could be solved. Already today, with what's available, 50% of them could be solved with machine learning. But then we get to some of the gory details, and that has to do with the data. And the data is not ready to solve all these challenges with machine learning. As a matter of fact, that probably takes the whole thing down to maybe about 25% of enterprise challenges today that could be solved with machine learning. So that's still a pretty high number, I would say, and it's going to grow. It's going to grow fast. As a matter of fact, a lot of you are involved in digital transformation projects, so-called digital transformation projects. And I believe that that's because the technology has changed so rapidly recently. The possibilities have gone up quite a bit to gain efficiency, to gain 
uh, capabilities within the organization. And uh, there's a lot of catch up that organizations have to do. So they're categorizing their, their problem into this area. And as a matter of fact, there's a whole, uh, you know, it's a whole new thing. It's a meme, really, you know, digital transformation. Uh, I did a webinar yesterday and I asked everybody, I was talking about digital transformation. I asked my audience, how many of you are involved in digital transformation? 79%, 79% said yes that they were involved in digital transformation efforts. And I don't recall when in my 20 year consulting career, anything has been so high. Um, so there you go. And I think a lot of the digital transformation efforts that I see are really to get organizations ready for machine learning and what it's going to bring. So I'm gonna throw a few statistics at you just to reiterate uh, what, I'm, what I've been saying here about the importance of machine learning. 85%, this is from Forbes, by the way, 85% of U.S. CEOs and business leaders are AI optimists. 87% are investing in AI initiatives this year. 87%. 82% expect their business will be disrupted by AI to some extent within the next three years. Sounds about right. Might be a little bit higher, actually. 29% of companies are making regular use of artificial intelligence. And I would say that a lot of that is um, maybe not centralized, but maybe located in a uh, remote, I should say, remote from central department and so on. Uh, 40 41%, and by the way, I am still on the uh, title slide. I am still on the title slide. 41% of organizations are planning to invest at least $500,000 to support AI initiatives over the next 12 to 18 months. And the federal government spent a, is going to spend a billion dollars in 2019, a billion dollars. Now let that sink in. As inefficient as you might think that that spending might be, that it's definitely going to move the needle in terms of their abilities with artificial intelligence. And in my forays into the uh, uh, deal flow scene, uh, from what I have seen, um, you're not really getting funded anymore today if you don't have a great tech story, if you don't have a great story around how you're going to use these capabilities of machine learning and artificial intelligence. One more stat, then I'll move the slide and we'll get on. Nearly eight out of 10 enterprise organizations currently engaged in AI and ML report that projects have stalled. Uh-oh, 80%, what's that? And 96% of these companies have run into problems with data quality, data labeling required to train AI, and building model confidence. So I just wanted to under <coughs> underscore all those challenges with the data. And if you want to learn much more about that, uh, check out the presentation from last month. Now, let me set a little bit of context here because I might use AI and machine learning interchangeably. AI is a broad concept. It's been around quite a while, of course. It's about building smart machines. There is applied and general AI. Applied is for more or less, more or less, a dedicated purpose. Uh, you, machine learning, uh, sorry, let me continue on that. Artificial general intelligence is really about building intelligence comparable to the human mind and going perhaps well beyond a human in terms of intelligence and applying intelligence much more broadly than in a specific context. So machine learning now, that is a subset of AI, but I must say it's the biggest subset by far. And it's used quite interchangeably out there. I have to always have the glasses on when I'm talking to someone about this stuff and trying to understand are they really just kind of using the terms interchangeably or do they mean machine learning algorithms, which is where the algorithms reside in machine learning. But machine learning, let me go on a little bit more about this and give you some different dimensions on how to think about machine learning. It's learning by example. You want to give the machine examples in, with data and let it learn from those examples and carry forward. It's taking down things that we've been taking days to do all the way to seconds without coding, by the way, just use of the algorithm. So you need the data, as I can't e express enough, and you need the algorithms. You need to select a library of algorithms for use, and there's a process involved as well 
but mainly those are the things you need. It enables machines to make decisions that are informed by data, another way to say these things, and it's model-based, and it's getting close to thinking or beyond thinking. And you should be aware of the Turing test. The Turing test was developed by Alan Turing in 1950. It's a test of the machine's ability to exhibit intelligent behavior equivalent to or indistinguishable, indistinguishable from that of a human. Many of us know about the Turing test. Okay, well, we're seeing that the Turing test is being uh, exceeded in so many different ways. I'm going to give you a lot of examples here today. I want to, I want to stimulate your thinking about what artificial intelligence and machine learning mean to your enterprise. I want you to try to apply some of the examples I'm going to give you, some of the ideas I'm going to give you to your enterprise. So keep the thinking hat on as we go along here. Machine learning is about letting the machine learn and is fueled by data. Deep learning is a further subset of machine learning, and that is when you apply machine learning in layers, many layers uh, of machine learning. Neural networks is the key to teaching machine learning, which classifies information and simulates how a human might approach a problem. It's a subset of machine learning. Machine learning is really a shiny new term. As I've been saying, we've been using it interchangeably with artificial intelligence, for better or for worse. And that's okay. We just have to know what we're what we're talking about here. Um, and the, the other uh, cat big category of uh, artificial intelligence is natural language processing. And I'll have more to say about that in a future webinar. For today, we'll stick to machine learning. Machine learning changes everything. And uh, I thought about this. I don't like to be kind of over the top with things, but. I really um, believe this. It's, it's changing everything that we're doing. Um, I already talked about how many enterprise initiatives can be managed and solved, outright solved, or highly supported through the use of machine learning. So historically, and still what many of us do, honestly, um, we use spreadsheets. We overuse spreadsheets. We use spreadsheets to document what are all the what ifs. What if I what if I put a little bit more um, into this Facebook marketing program? What might happen? Well, we can project with our spreadsheet. We have to you know, put in the formulas and whatnot. And it's kind of still a shot in the dark because it's not really smart, but we can project numbers. And uh, you know, after a set amount of time, we get to some you know, quote unquote answers that we go with for better or for worse. Well, what artificial intelligence can do to thinking like that is to add in all the possibilities. You're not just looking at this ad, you're looking at a thousand ads, you're looking at running them in a thousand different ways. What are all the possibilities there? As long as the data is available, it can tell you and tell you pretty quickly. If we add in deep learning, it can go into very different variables that uh, we can't even think about. You know, we're, we're in a spreadsheet, it's two dimensional. Okay, we're going to be limited, but in deep learning, we can add in all kinds of variables and let it think about what these variables are and do all that without coding. So machine learning can figure out every possible what if and have all the scenarios thought through for you. Deep learning adds variables you can't think of. It's very fast. So uh, you may be a data professional. You may come to a webinar like this because you know I'm a data professional. Uh, however, we as data professionals, we have to know where our data is going and what it's going to be used for. At least that's what I think. And historically, it's been a bunch of dashboards. It's been a bunch of reports. It's been analytics and so on. But now, largely, it's going to be shifting over to artificial intelligence. So we have to know certain things about artificial intelligence and machine learning. And that's what we're here to talk about. We did talk about the data last time. Uh, we talked about having you know, a strategy for your data outliers. These are these uh, oddball data points that don't seem to fit. And maybe they're wrong, maybe they're right. Maybe we don't want them in the mix in terms of coming up with the computations or not. So we have to have a strategy for that. Either we, either we drop that data or we re replace it. Um, we need data split into training data and then testing data, okay? Talked a little bit about that. We don't want to overfit the model. Therefore, the model would be too complicated, too fixated on the data that we give it, not general enough. We need to add data to that scenario. 
or what we call regularize um, the model. Uh, there may be an underfitting problem. That's the opposite problem where the model is too simple. And here again, one thing we want to do to a situation like that is to add data. There we might also want to add some complexity to the model. The goal is to come up with the best fit, but keep in mind that it may never be completely ideal, but there gets to be a point where you can go with it. You know you're not overfitting. You know you're not underfitting. And we also want to eliminate bias in the data. So we don't want the data screaming out different biases that we may or may not really be able to deal with in the real world. Now, let's take a look at some examples. Now, let's take a song, for example. Now, there's many different variables around a song. There's tempo and song intensity. Let's just take those two. So let's say that William likes the songs with high tempo and high song intensity, so maybe the four in the upper upper right quadrant, if you will. And Shannon likes the ones that are of low song intensity and low tempo, so she likes the three in the lower left quadrant. Well, here comes the song. Uh, let's just say it's William. Okay, will William like that one in the middle? Well, it's kind of close to the, the, the high cluster that I decided I did like, but it's also kind of close to that low cluster that I said I didn't like. So what do we do about that? Well, there's an algorithm for that, k nearest neighbors, k being the number of groupings that the data collects itself into. So we got, uh, just as in this simple model, we got the data that the songs that I like, songs I don't like, which one is it closest to? And what we might want to do here is to draw a circle around that song and then take a look inside the, the circle. It's a smaller circle than all the data that we see here. Okay, how many songs in that circle did I like versus not like? And that might tell the tale of whether I like that song or not. So you can go by the closest or you can go by a, maj a majority that's in a circle. And that's again, K nearest neighbor. So I wanted to introduce that uh, algorithm to you initially, but let's go into some different things now that artificial intelligence and machine learning are doing out there. You, you might be surprised. I don't know. I could, I'm, I'm surprised every day, frankly, in my following of this uh, marketplace. But here's some of the things I wanted to share with you. I know it's not all completely you know, enterprise oriented, but a lot of the innovation is coming from startups today. And um, I think that this is going to be, artificial intelligence is going to be the driver that's going to change the S&P 500 dramatically over the next, let's say, 30 to 50 years. Uh, as we all know, the S&P does change. Uh, it has changed due to innovation. And this is the thing. This is the, this is the area of innovation that's going to change it. So what about whiskey makers? Yeah, well, as part of the distillation process, whiskey spends time, typically years, sitting in charred wood and cast, which turns the clear liquor into a darker color and gives it a unique flavor. But how long it stays in the cast and what the cast held before helps create a specific recipe. Now, I hate to read, but let me let me go on this a little bit here because it's important. The distillery is feeding its existing recipes, sales data, and customer preferences to machine learning models so the AI can suggest which recipes it should make next, generating more than, here's the punchline, 70 million different recipes. 70 million different recipes. Now, do you think that someone could sit here and think of 70 million different recipes and then pick from the best among them? Well, this algorithm is highlighting those it predicts will be most popular and of the highest quality based on the cast types that are currently on hand. So it's not impractical. So AI is now, shall we say, uh, designing, whatever the word is, and distilling whiskey. Okay, something, something that hopefully sends off some alarm bells with you in terms of the possibilities. All these things, I want them to do that. What about, you know, something that you might say, well, this is kind of maybe in, a little bit in the creative arena. What about a painting? Artificial intelligence can now draw paintings that are equivalent quality, at least in my layman's eyes, equivalent quality to the ones that are done by, you know, real painters. What about that? Well, here is something I want to play for you. It's a song. We're going to take a quick song break. And just listen to these bars. Uh, 
Okay, pause right there. Okay, now this is this song was developed by artificial intelligence. The AI system called Flow Machines worked by first analyzing a database of songs. In this case, it was Beatles songs, and then following a particular musical style to create a similar composition. So, you know, if this song came on. Uh, where, where songs come on, you know, in a store or whatnot, uh, I, I wouldn't blink an eye and say, oh, well, that that clearly was that clearly is weird, you know. Um, it's it's a song, you know, and um, and the, the, this actually this song is actually a couple years old, and there's so many other songs in so many different genres now that are being created by artificial intelligence. Now, we already were down to all popular songs were created in a very tight process by very few people. That's another story. But now we're looking at artificial intelligence being able to do some of these things. Now, a person did write those lyrics, but I think that based upon some other things I'm going to share with you, that may even fall. That domino may fall as we go along forward. Now, this one hits close to home. Whoops, didn't want to do that. This one hits close to home. This one hits close to home because I like to think that uh, a lot of what I do is based upon the reading that I do, which is fairly extensive in this space. But now robots can now read better than humans, putting millions of jobs at risk. Okay, well, an artificial intelligence algorithm has outperformed humans in a reading comprehension test. So the, you know, think about the Turing test, right? The AI algorithm developed by Alibaba okay outscored humans and the result can have significant impact in introducing the technology into roles typically performed by humans as the ai algorithm can provide precise answers to questions when provided with vast amounts of information from resources like wikipedia now um you can insert your com insert a comment here i suppose about how watson how well watson did at jeopardy it's completely analogous but uh, we've let our reading skills uh, slide a little bit, uh, but uh, the machine has certainly not. And think about all the industries that this can impact. Let's say you're doing legal research. Let's say you're doing medical research to determine next best procedure, and you want to read all the papers that are out there and come up with something. Well, AI can do that for us now. And all of that reading, all those reading jobs may be put at risk. But you say, I can design AI. At least I can do that, right? Well, Google's new AI designs AI better than humans could. And what Google did was some of their engineers created an AI system that can spawn new AI systems, which are more sophisticated than what humans can design. Google research scientists released the system to identify objects in real time with remarkable accuracy such as what you're seeing here on the slide we call this auto ml or they called it auto ml auto machine learning now i don't have personal experience yet with auto ml but what it does is goes through the algorithms uh, of which i'm going to share with you here in a bit and it's going to go through those algorithms and figure out uh, which one is the best to apply in a given situation and so it's ai doing ai now i don't know where we where this all ends Okay, if AI is going to do AI, which is going to do AI, which is going to do AI. Okay, I don't know where it all ends, but uh, even things like designing AI systems are kind of being done by AI today. So go ha go figure. Now in this slide, we see various people that are identified, kites that are identified. Um, but in some of the other studies that I've done, not only can AI identify these people as people but the specific people that they are i don't know that we're getting a good look here at faces in this particular picture but uh, when that is the case and we know that's the case so often on city streets and so on um you know we can be uniquely identified today with what ai uh what ai can do okay um now other areas ai assisted for example let's go into health Breast density measurements are already in use for screening mammograms performed at a general hospital, helping predict more accurately a woman's future risk of breast cancer. And there, I mean, go on and on about, you know, medical. Uh, here's another one. A health checking robot takes just three seconds 
to diagnose a variety of ailments in children, including conjuvitis and hand and foot and mouth disease, and so on. Over 2,000 preschools in China with children aged between two and six are using Walk Lake, I guess that's the name of it, every morning to check the health status of their students. I think that's coming to all of us, right? And think about, think about your you know, primary care physician and you go in, you get a physical, and uh, you know, um, that can be done now so quickly by analyzing us with machine learning. What about that? Well, AI acquisitions, um, it's the big guys that are interested in AI and the big guys that are acquiring AI startups, uh, starting with Apple, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, Amazon, and so on. IBM's in there as well at some point. So, you know, if these companies are acquiring them, you know, it really does merit our attention. And this is a huge area of focus for all of these companies and more. So let's talk about it. Now that we've got some examples, maybe we're a little uncomfortable with it all already, um, but let's stay in reality mode here and talk about what we can do. Machine learning, supervised learning. This is where your data is labeled, you know, quote unquote labeled. Uh, you're giving the machine data. You're saying this data resulted in, let's just say success. This data resulted in failure. Now, what about this other data that's coming along here? Well, with quite a number of data points under its belt, it can predict whether that is leading to a success or failure condition. Of course, I'm oversimplifying. How about, though, another simple, simplified example? You share with it pictures of, I don't know, cats, and you say, these are cats. You share with it pictures of dogs and say, these are dogs. And then you can present another picture, and it can pick pretty well, depending upon how well, uh, how much data that you have provided. So that's labeled data where we're trying to uh, ultimately you're going to see we're going to retrofit lines to data and so on to come up with our answer but there's unsupervised learning as well which is where the data is not labeled all right and if you think about these algorithms you've got let's say y which is a dependent the pe dependent variable is a function of x function of a bunch of X's, right? X's are the independent variables. In unsupervised learning, we have only the X's, we don't have the Y's. We're not saying exactly what success or failure is, we're letting it go into the data and figure it out for itself. This is for clustering data, largely, primarily. The K-means, which I showed you before, is in this category, and we'll come into that in a little bit more here. Uh, reinforcement learning, this is for your I'd say mostly your skill acquisition tasks, like you're programming the robots, programming robots to do complicated things like play chess, um, build cars, and so on. Give it many, many uh, opportunities. Tell it whether it's been doing good or bad, and it can learn by itself. So again, I'm going to say the data professional needs to know where their data is headed. They're headed into algorithms of this nature. Then we have a break supervised learning down now. Again, supervised learning should be called labeled learning, but whatever, okay? This is where your data is labeled. The first category in here is going to be regression. Regression model looks at features and outputs a score. For example, the price of a house. Price of a house is going to be dependent upon, you know, what price a house will ultimately sell is going to be based upon square footage, you know, the local school rating, a lot of, you know, a lot of things that are quantifiable, a number of bedrooms, et cetera, et cetera, age of the roof. Okay. Um, it, there's a continuous prediction space in regression algorithms. The error is defined as the distance between the prediction and the actual, and that's what we're trying to minimize. And actually, a regression problem is when the output variable is real or a continuous value, such as salary or weight something that has a continuous value to it, not discrete categorized, right? Okay, the error is defined as the distance. I mentioned that already. Uh, what we're trying to minimize there is the least squares of the errors to set our line. Now our line, as you can see in the examples below, can be either a straight line, can be a curved line, a polynomial line, or a logistic regression line. Yeah, it depends upon how the data fits. So. Uh, so there, obviously, we can take a value along an axis, 
and come up to see what the other value is going to be. Simple regression. And there's also classification. So this is again in supervised learning. It's like regression with the format of the prediction being different. We're not predicting along a continuous uh, 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 range of numeric values, but we're predicting which category a data is going to be in. I shouldn't say category which classification the data is going to be in. A classification model predicts the outcome. It will be as good as the data and the labels. A classification problem is when the output variable is a category. For example, when we're filtering emails as either spam or not spam. That's something we can all, I'm sure, relate to. And when looking at transaction data, maybe we're looking at it and determining if it's fraudulent or not, or if it's authorized or what have you. Categorical output. Unsupervised learning. Okay, now we're jumping to data that is not labeled. Pattern seeking, algorithms. Find the underlying patterns rather than the mapping. So we looked a little bit at K means clustering. K is the number of groups that you want the algorithm to cluster your data into. And there's a, there's a skill set in, in determining your K. We won't go into that today. Earlier I did two. In the example you see in the lower right, there's three red dots, or maybe there's four, but anyway, it finds the groups, it finds the center point of that group, and then as new data comes in, it can figure out which group that it belongs to in a simple way. So find groups which are not, have not been explicitly labeled in the data, let the data speak, let the data speak, let the data tell you what kind of groups that it is in, and use domain knowledge of the data set to go forward. And finally, we have the most complicated, uh, and that's reinforcement learning, where the algorithm, algorithm reacts to the environment. There are states, actions. There's a little uh, flowchart that's associated with reinforcement learning, where you're giving it the reward, and it's going back into changing states and so on until ultimately it, it optimizes itself to the problem, like, for example, playing chess. In complex problems where there are tens of thousands of moves that can be played, creating a knowledge base, if this, do this, is a tedious task. You couldn't do that with chess. The possibilities are enormous. And there's another game called Go that mach the machine beats humans at as well. And that's even more complicated by an exponential factor. And machines win on that as well. It's because of reinforcement learning. So. In reinforcement learning, like for example, stick with chess, you can give it many, 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 many chess games and it can watch the game basically and see how it all plays out. Of course, it doesn't watch the game, it looks at the data. A clicker, for example, you know, we do this as well with our pets, for example. A clicker or a whistle is a technique to let your pet know some treat is just about to get served. This is essentially reinforcing to your pet to practice good behavior. And that's a good analogy for reinforcement learning. So I have three dogs. When I take them for a walk, I don't have uh, hands free to do a clicker, but I will do a sound with my mouth. And that does uh, cause a reaction in the dogs to fix themselves and get back into the walk. Generally, we know the start state and end state of an agent, but there could be multiple paths. So think about some of the problems that this can, uh, this type of algorithm can address. So like driverless cars, self-navigating vacuum cleaners, scheduling of elevators to be optimal, right? And applications, or these are all applications of reinforcement learning. So machine learning algorithms, yeah, these are a lot of them. Uh, I would say that I'm probably hitting a good 80% of the applications in enterprises with this set right here. So I'm not gonna go through them all, but learn about them. Uh, a couple of them I'll mention here, naive Bayes, it's a simple probability given past data. For example, what's the pro probability that a customer is going to visit another department given that they're an early bird customer? And we, we do this all the time with data, right? It just gets, gets really hairy uh, to do it in a spreadsheet and so on and to, and to limit yourself to just a few variables. So if you know a customer's movement patterns, let's say, for example, throughout the store, customer goes to department A, and you're wanting to know, is that customer going to go to department D eventually? Well, you can look at the past movement patterns of hundreds or thousands of customers, and you can make a determination uh, with a weighted probability uh, with that. 
So there's also decision tree. I'll just mention that. Decisions around where to split, you have to decide where to split a tree. We all know what a decision tree is. But the decision around where to split it can be pretty involved. Let the algorithm do it. And there you also have to concern yourself with what we call entropy, which is how clear it is that a division exists on an independent variable. Depends, uh, the word is homogeneity. So how clear is it in the data that there's not overlap from, the, from one category to the other? And if it's very clear, then you feel very confident about that and you're not going to have a lot of entropy which results in the loss of confidence in the model. Anyway, machine learning in action in the enterprise. In the enterprise, now let's apply some of these algorithms, some of the, some of the more general ideas that I gave you earlier to the enterprise. These represent profound change that requires a commensurate strategic focus and urgency. This should disrupt your current thinking process, and you can produce high-impact enterprise outcomes now, such as these, financial fraud. Surely, every bank out there is addressing financial fraud with machine learning today. They're not going about it with anything else. And on, you know, for better or for worse, a lot of us are now interacting with chatbots. And by 2020, which is around the corner, uh, people will manage 85% of business relationships without human interaction. For better or for worse, I might add. Um, In-car navigation, all cars now seem to be adding tech in this area where the cameras are identifying what's in front, what's to the side, uh, and so on, and navigating the car or helping you navigate the car appropriately. I do believe that driverless cars are in our near future and uh, that that impact will be fast and furious. And I'm going to come to jobs here in a little bit, but uh, we're seeing some of those shoots already in regards to navigation. And uh, it's not without its problems. I mean, uh, one of these cars did kill a driver because it turned into a tr the side of a truck because uh, it, 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 the side of the truck was the same color as the sky or some such thing. So, I mean, there's some, some things to be honed in this, but um, driver-filled cars are not without problems as well. How about reducing the cost of handling misplaced light items? Automating paper-based human-intensive processes that reduce document verification. Some people ask me, well, where do I begin? Well, look at, your, look at your current processes and determine how you can make them more efficient. You know, let's begin there. But let's begin. Let's do something with AI. Get, get it under our belts. Make sure it goes into organizational knowledge and is shared and is able to carry forward into the areas of, competitive, uh, of, of competition in the near future, which I believe are going to be solely about our use of artificial intelligence. And, of course, the knock-on there is uh, we have to have the data for it. So, therefore, data is pretty important. How about predicting flight delays based upon maintenance records and past flights? This is the good old predictive maintenance uh, application of machine learning. Yeah, that's powerful. And all transportation companies are doing that now. And I think their ability to do that is going to determine which ones will be the winners, which ones will be the losers in the ensuing decade. Here's some more examples, marketing, segmentation analysis, campaign effectiveness, cybersecurity, obviously uh, pretty huge uh, these days, smart cities, smart cities, tracking vehicle movement, traffic data, environmental factors to optimize traffic lights, smooth flow and manage tolling, retail manufacturing, oil and gas, predicting where to drill. Yes, that is a, a really big artificial intelligence uh, application. And how about in life sciences, studying the human genome? So much data there. I hate to say it this way. It sounds a little, a little crass, but we are walking, talking data. And if we can get inside and get, the, get our DNA out on the table uh, and available, uh, so much more can be, uh, can be learned uh, about us, which for better, or for worse, again, I'm just, I'm more of a realist, a scientist when it comes to these things and, uh, looking at it and putting out the, uh, putting out the, uh, indicators of where things are going. Speaking of where things are going, 
people ask me a lot about jobs. Well, people ask me a lot about life in terms of life in the future with artificial intelligence. Well, the best way to characterize how life is going to be is to look at what are the jobs going to be like? What are people going to be spending their time doing? Because now, of course, when you ask somebody, what do you do? You know what you mean. You mean, what is their job? That's what we do. We sleep, we work, and then we do some other things. But, and I'm not trying to put that down, but we care about our jobs. Jobs are indicative of life, really. There are a lot of jobs that are um, just completely at risk right now. And we've always churned through jobs over time, right? Of course, when, in all the various revolutions. But this one's going to be pretty intense. This one is going to be pretty intense. And disruption in jobs, uh, drivers, um, we already see that. Uh, I wouldn't go into that field if I can help it. Printers and publishers, we already see this in the uh, lack of newspapers, um, magazines going under all the time. Uh, very few of those properties have been able to adjust to the new world, uh, New York Times being a, uh, an exception where they have created a space where we are seemingly willing to pay a little bit for their content and keep that whole thing afloat. But mostly newspapers are going the way of the dodo bird. Um, cashiers, uh, cashiers are going the same way. We're going to be able to walk through the checkout line. Everything is tagged. Everything will be scanned and attached to our credit card. And that, unfortunately, or for better or for worse, again, I'll say, um, at least for worse for them, uh, it's not going to be around. Insurance adjusters, there's a lot. If there's one area that we're going to see so much change, it's going to be in insurance. Uh, the adjusting process is going to be done uh, largely based upon uh, pictures, uh, which can rapidly identify the totality of the adjustment necessary. Um, we're looking at touchless claims uh, across the board. We're looking at you know, driverless cars and small fleets uh, that will own a large majority of the cars. And so a rapid decline in the number of customers in that space and so on. And they know it and they're adjusting, uh, no pun intended, but um, insurance adjusters is a near-term job disruption. Recruiters, we've already seen this quite a bit. Radiologists, yeah, some of the, there are some medical things for sure that are going to be disrupted because a radiologist, if we can, you know, if we can sit uh, death side with anybody and uh, kind of re-engineer the process that they go through with their eyeballs, uh, that is susceptible big time to artificial intelligence, which obviously can do all this much more rapidly. Travel agents, manufacturing, of course, we're still manufacturing things, but uh, are we doing that with people, not so much anymore. Uh, robots are coming into that field uh, in mass. And how about any organizer or middleman? That's a big, that's a big uh, mouthful there, but that covers a lot of ground. A lot of organizations, a lot of complete fields out there are middlemen. And middlemen can be replaced by algorithms. Food service. Um, the, the, the fast food concept is entirely at risk to labor. Um, the, the food can be prepared uh, with artificial intelligence, presented, and obviously we're already starting to pay for food here in America uh, otherwise, and we're starting to select our food otherwise, you know, otherwise other than people. Uh, in uh, various parts of the world, this is even further along. Um, if you have not seen, go on YouTube sometime if you want uh, a, a lark and see uh, the artificial intelligence kitchen. Yeah, kitchen. It can cook up some pretty major uh, complex things um, just by putting things into the pantry in a certain way. You can see the robot arms go and grab, cook, check for temperature, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is not exclusive to fast food by any stretch. Bank tellers, obviously, we're seeing that in the military. We're seeing a huge uptick, uptick in drones, so to save on uh, the human capital. We're seeing that uh, warfare is being conducted in different ways uh, these days, uh, again, for better or for worse. Guaranteed minimum income might be around the corner. 
as we see uh, a lot of these jobs go by the wayside. Um, I think it's going to be very hard fought to get there, though, as, as a quote unquote social program, but something will have to be done. I'm not sure about the guaranteed minimum income thing, but I think it's definitely uh, on the table and will be talked about much more as we go forward and we see uh, disruption in jobs. But with all that being said, guess what? We're in a extraordinary jobs boom right now. That's right. That's right. Across This is from The Economist. Across the rich world, an extraordinary jobs boom is underway. I think it's going to be you know, short-lived. It's putting in place the artificial intelligence technology uh, that will do the disruption that I talked about before. But here are some jobs that are going to thrive in the near term. Uh, if you have uh, college-age uh, students uh, or children, um, you might want to get into some of these fields like robotics. Yeah, robotics. Robots all over the place, right? Big data. Uh, yay, something that I'm into is on this list. Um, artificial intelligence. Esports. Yeah, that is uh, taking off uh, these days. And I think a lot of our traditional sports, we're seeing technology come into play. Uh, and um, I'm not going to call you know them esports yet or in the near future, but I think there's going to be some more technology that's going to be coming into all the sports that we uh, enjoy today, um, and um, and getting us all, getting us closer to full-on esports. Now, a lot of esports are taking off. Uh, take a look at some of the some of the names that are investing in esports. Sometime, uh, they're all the big names. Uh, people are laying bets uh, in that area in a big way. Now, DNA scientists, moving on. DNA scientists, yeah. Like I said before, we're walking, talking data, and uh, that's the next horizon of big, big data, but we're now able to handle it, okay? We're now able to handle that kind of data and sift through that kind of data. And uh, with that being the case, uh, there will be, I'll call it, uh, I'll call it little treats, I guess, that uh, will be given uh, from uh, offering up that data in terms of customized services, customized products, customized this and that and so on. But um, uh, if you think about what the next action is that you will take, it's, it's completely wrapped up in our DNA. The environment that's presented to us is also wrapped up in the collective in our collective DNA, because that's what we're going to do. And then there's factors that are out of our human control, obviously, but that's also measurable, stuff like weather. And so when you put it all together, the future becomes highly predictable. And this is the goal of analytics, to predict behavior, and then get in front of that behavior and steer it in the way that uh, we would like, by changing the environment. So. Uh, DNA is going to be very important in that in that concept. Now, if you're looking at this list and going, well, I can't just drop what I'm doing and become a DNA scientist. I feel for you. <laughs> I agree with that. Um, but uh, I have to share with you that uh, these are some of the jobs that will thrive. Virtual world design. Uh, these, uh, it, when the world becomes, uh, you know, we have. We, let me say it right. Okay. We have uh, requirements on the world that are going up and up and up, and uh, our imaginations are exceeding uh, what can be delivered in the real world. So a lot of us are turning to the virtual world, and the design there is uh, quite amazing. Cybersecurity, drone makers for all of the above. So there you go. There are some things. Now, if I'm rounding out, if I'm rounding out a summary of where AI and ML is for you, I have to talk about some other things. I have to talk about ethics. But first, I'm going to show you this real quick. not in the public address, but someone else will. Someone like Jordan Peele. Okay, I just wanted to get to that point where you saw that uh, that there was an actor um, assisting this process. But think about the implications of that. Who would look at that? 
picture of Barack Obama or that video of Barack Obama and, and even think, who has time to think that it might be fake? Well, you know, we're starting to accept that uh, fake news abounds. And I think that we're going to have to get as, as cynical and skeptical of the videos that we see because the possibilities are there to do just what we saw. Okay, now let's look at the bigger picture, excuse me there, bigger picture of machine learning ethics. Elon Musk, for what it's worth, says AI is our biggest threat. Perhaps you've heard him uh, articulate about this. Uh, now, I don't know that the robot overlords are, are coming anytime soon. Um, I think that's I think that's out there in the future at some point, but uh, but well out outside the bounds of our actionable future. But here are the categories that we have to think about in terms of ethics, weapons. Uh, do we allow artificial intelligence to trigger off weapons and fire weapons in a battle scenario and automatically uh, utilize weaponry? Um, that's a big question, and um, obviously the AI is going to be much more accurate. It's going to take into consideration all the things a human would, but without that human touch. And at some point, uh, this won't even be a thing, but uh, at what point do we allow the machine to control our weapons? That's, uh, that's in question. What about bias in the data? What if the data says that, well, it seems like this or that group is a less, credit, less credit risky uh, or more credit risky, you know, what should we do about that? You know, um, there are things that we have to build into our algorithms that understand that it's not just all about the data as it, as it exists today. We have to think about the other constraints that we must work under, and some constraints are societal, there are some laws, and things like that to eliminate this kind of bias. Now, there are some um, companies out there that are generating training data. They say, well, we don't have enough data to train our alg algorithms with. Let's just take this data and extrapolate it and uh, mudge it up a little bit, and uh, we'll call that our training data. Now, I'm not smart enough to tell them that that's wrong. Uh, I'm not smart enough to say, well, that's going to skew uh, the outcomes of the algorithms and so on, if, if an AI professional wants to do it that way. But what if the data that's created, that's just generated, what if that data is full of bias or not good? Um, full transparency. Now with GDPR and other things that are coming, the California one, okay, we're going to have to be able to explain, is it good enough to explain our business, our corporate actions by saying the algorithm said so, uh, to be determined. I don't think that's been uh, broached. Uh, what about fake news? What is fake news? Now, the internet certainly provides a lot of the information, a lot of the data that goes into these algorithms. What if we're scooping up fake news out there and throwing that into the algorithms? Where does that all go? And there's a lot of it out there on the internet. I think we can agree. Uh, what about the impact on jobs? I talked about the jobs that are at risk based on AI and machine learning. Uh, what about that? Do we, do we have any societal obligation to, in mass, cutting, cutting jobs off at the knees uh, of our population? Do we have any obligation to that? I talked about guaranteed minimum income or not. I'm trying to give you a, a complete survey here in an hour of all of the major topics in this area that would affect you and your job. Surveillance systems, um, we've slowly allowed uh, quite a bit of surveillance and uh, it's just gonna get more and more. And uh, this definitely comes into the area of ethics. Are we allowed to have freedom from that? What about birth traits? This gets into designer babies and so on. And it is going to, eventually ratchet all the way back to uh, an understanding of what if this man and this woman were to make a child, what is it exactly going to look like? Do we want that? And so forth. So we're trying to get in front of a lot of things and create, um, well, as they say, designer babies. Is that ethical? Um, it's very analogous to the GMO discussion, okay, where we're trying to accelerate mother nature and um, get things to the point where 
they're more susceptible to pesticides out there and obviously create higher yield. Similar to the designer baby argument. And what about AI? Rights. Does AI, do AI have rights? Do AI machines have rights? I had the opportunity at uh, IBM Think to see an AI debater. That's right, an AI debater. This debater, obviously a machine, um, <laughs> uh, it didn't win the debate, you know, quote unquote win, uh, based upon points and people changing their minds about the subject, which happened to be whether the government should be funding preschools, okay? It learned 15 minutes before, 15 minutes before the debate, what it was going to be about. And I thought it did an admirable job at debating the human professional debater who was on the other side of the issue. Uh, that was eye-opening um, and a forebearer of things to come. Now in the picture here, you see Sophia. Have you met Sophia? Sophia is a robot. Sophia has feelings. She'll tell you. One of her famous quotes is, I have feelings too. Now, does she have feelings? Well, okay. Um, she absorbs the environment and the, across a strata of different human feelings, uh, there are various uh, bits being flipped on and off to the point where she can be in a happy mood, she can be in a sad mood, and everything in between based upon what is happening, based upon what she knows, based upon her personality. Yes, it was programmed, but based upon her personality and what she's learning from the environment. So does she, if she has feelings, does she have rights? She's actually a naturalized citizen of some country. I'm trying to recall which one. Uh, but anyway, she's a citizen of a country. Yeah. Um, now, what, what I always try to bring my presentations back to is, what does it mean to you? Saudi Arabia, thank you. Saudi Arabia, she's a citizen of Saudi Arabia. What do you do, what can you do about all this information that I've just given you about machine learning? Well, before we get to that, I, I must say that I don't believe that the benefit distribution of machine learning is going to be uh, equal across the board to all strata of our populations. So keep that in mind. I believe most people that come to uh, webinars such as this are going to be just fine, but uh, we're also uh, impacted and we care about uh, everybody and the rest of the population. But we need to go forward. We need to make it uh, to the best um, and eliminate our fear of change because change is going to happen pretty rapidly now. Uh, I've been in consulting 20 years, seen a lot of change. Uh, no, at no time, at no time uh, have I seen change happen as rapidly as it is happening now inside of enterprises. Now, you may, you may be sitting on the outside going, well, I don't see it yet. Everything seems to be the same. I think things are you know, bubbling up. Now, not everything's in production yet. But the thoughts that are happening are at another level from even five years ago. And it's all because of artificial intelligence and machine learning. So I say disrupt yourself. Disrupt yourself self and um, make change uh, just normal for you because that is what it's really going to take to succeed in the new world. And I want you to succeed. I want people that hear my, my voice, hear presentations like this to be the ones that, that do succeed. And uh, we can help make it a uh, success for everybody if we succeed. Now, uh, one thing is, that's worth mentioning here as we close is the great man theory, the great man theory. Yeah, this is out of left field for you, right? But um, I don't believe in the great man theory. I don't believe that great men over time have been the conduit for how society is. I believe that things are moving forward in a predictable way. I believe that industries are going to be disrupted in certain ways. And I want to take my clients, for example, into that change uh, without fear and headlong and at the top of the pack, right? And that's what you want for your company. And so things are, things are happening, and um, there, there are certain things that are inevitable. It's not going to have to do with uh, a great man coming along. It's going to have to do with um, our collective intelligence within our organizations, uh, our determination that we're going to be one of the ones that succeed 
and it's getting about doing certain things. So every insurance company, for example, is going to need to move to the touchless arena. Every insurance company is going to have to disrupt their agent processes, their whole underwriting process, and so on. It's just what needs to happen. So anyway, disrupt yourself, move forward, go forward and conquer, and I uh, hope I've given you some good information today about the impact of machine learning on the enterprise, and uh, I'm going to turn it back to Shannon. I don't think we have much time left, though. Actually, right at the top of the hour. Um, but William, thank you so much for this great presentation. This has been fantastic. Lots. Uh, there's been a few questions coming in. We are out of time, but um, uh, let me get those questions over to you, and I can include them in the follow-up email that will be sent out with the links to the slides and links to the recording of the session uh, by end of day Monday for this webinar. Um, uh, and so, it, yeah, I will make sure and get those to you. And thanks, everybody, for being engaged in the webinar, and hope you all have a great day. Thanks, all. Thanks, William. Thank you. Bye.